Jasmine, it's yours. All right, great. Uh, thank you for staying with us this time. And we will reward you by ending with uh, Chris Wiggins from Columbia giving his living history. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share um, the slides. Is that visible? Can you see, can you see slides yes. there? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, I'm Chris Wiggins, uh, and if you'd like to know more, I'll tell you, please feel free to email me or reach me at any of these locations. I might be responding on Twitter, but I don't tweet as much as I used to. So thanks very much to the organizers for having me. Um, my own research career, uh, my scientific career, I would say began with my first publication, which came out of undergraduate research in particle physics. I sometimes, when I meet people who do particle physics as undergraduates, I say, did you write code or did you solder? And in my case, I wrote code. I was part of a massive uh, collaboration of people. I got to spend a lot of time at three in the morning watching the spills from the test beam at the AGS in Brookhaven National Laboratory as an undergraduate. It's quite glamorous. Um, but that was my first publication, was, was part of a big team of particle physicists. Um, and I did research as an undergraduate, which I think had a big impact on me which continued on to my first sort of real publication, um, which wasn't actually published until I was a graduate student, but summer research that I did after um, I was an undergraduate doing partial differential equations on computers for computational fluid dynamics, which had a big impression on me, also because I liked um, complexity in nature. So getting to model complex systems in nature uh, was a big thrill. And I took that interest with me when I went to graduate school at Princeton. So I went to Princeton. Here's a picture of Princeton. This is actually a picture of Princeton today. I couldn't find a picture of what Princeton looked like in 1993, but some things that are the same is that the graduate college is across the golf course from the rest of the university. So I had the good fortune to go to Princeton for graduate school. I worked with Ray Goldstein, which was a lot of fun. Um, and Ray had an even stronger sense than I did for the art and beauty of, of complexity in nature and the challenge of trying to build mathematical models of complexity in nature. Um, at the end of my PhD, I had the good fortune to go to Institut Curie and work with Francois Amblard and other people uh, in working in biological physics at Curie, which was a, a great time. If you ever get a chance to go live in Paris, I urge you to do it. I, I did it sort of the safe way, which is I had a postdoc lined up, and then I went to Paris the basically for half a year after my PhD. The postdoc, I should say, was not in, in oh, I left out. Right, they're out of order. Okay, so the postdoc was here. Oh, no, actually, that is in order because while I was doing that, my time at Curie, I went to Carges for a summer school, which was great. Um, one of the greatest things that the theoretical physics community or the physics, physicists, theorists, and experimentalists do is have meetings in great locations, one of which was Carges in the summer of 98. Uh, it was wonderful. It was a great summer school with um, fantastic lectures by Robin Brunsma and Phil Nelson and Armand Ajdari and a whole mess of other really great people. I, I remember sitting down with Phil Nelson who said, oh, I'm thinking about writing a biological physics book, which he did, it's a great biological physics book. And I hope you check it out. Um, then I went to go do a postdoc and as a postdoc, I, I switched. I switched from being a, a theoretical physicist to an applied mathematician, which is, um, as some of the other speakers have noted, not always a tremendous gap, right? From theoretical physics to applied mathematics. In fact, my PhD advisor now is at a department of theoretical physics and applied mathematics where they're quite connected. So after that um, postdoc, I had the good fortune to secure a faculty position in applied mathematics at Columbia. I also spent some time in, in Europe. Again, I lived in Berlin uh, working with, um, working at the Han Meitner Institute uh, or with Erwin Frey on um, biological polymer modeling, uh, again, sort of Partial differential equations and stochastic dynamical systems modeling uh, polymer physics. And then I started my faculty position at Columbia. Um, en route, I, I spent a summer school in Carges, not Carges, Lesouche, which uh, was great and heard great lectures on, um, among other things, uh, statistical physicists looking at large data sets of microarray data and sequence data, and uh, a number of lectures on information theory by. Bill Bialik, and I got to meet some people from his group, which was very useful for introducing me to a style of statistical physics that um, 
was very new to me, specifically statistical physics, looking at data. I was very curious about um, how physicists were starting to ask statistical questions about large biological data sets in a way that was not at all, you know, like fitting F equals MA to data or something like that, something where you knew the fundamental model that seemed very different. So um, once I showed my faculty position, I had the good fortune to spend several visits at KITP in Santa Barbara, each of which were those ch chances to explore brand new subjects and talk to people from a variety of different fields, including people working on statistical problems, which I, I now would call machine learning, which was sort of an itch that was scratching at me ever since 1995. In 1995, one day when I was at the Burger King um, in Princeton, uh, Tim Holly came in with a copy of Science Magazine from the summer, and it was the image on the right, which is the um, first freely living organism to have its whole genome sequenced, Haemophilus influenzae. And I think many people realized that the whole relationship between biology and numbers was about to change. Um, by the time I finished my PhD, biologists were much more interested in talking to quantitative people than they had been when I started my PhD in 1993. Uh, and I felt like biology really changed for good. Uh, and it opened up a new tool set and the new tool set was driving people to ask very new questions about how we could understand biology through abundant data. As an example, there was this essay that I remember uh, struck me from Shirley Tillman, who would go on to be the president of, of Princeton saying, these are exciting times and we will need to have collaborations with disciplines outside of biology, which when I started my PhD, I, I didn't get the sense that biologists were particularly interested in collaborating with physicists. You know, maybe they could contribute some methods, but I, I felt like physicists were quite, uh, sorry, biologists were quite um, focused on, on one particular view of biology, and that had changed by the time I finished my PhD. So uh, I started trying to figure out what was good and what was not in that field, which um, there's no way to enter a new field like publishing in it. So I started publishing papers in machine learning applied to large biological data sets, um, trying to understand, for example, new viral species, new to the human beings once they've been evolving in another creature and trying to understand which creature they had been evolving in, not by doing phylogenetic trees, which is the way uh, Charles Darwin suggested in 1837 in the image on the left, but instead of doing that, doing decision trees, which is a machine learning algorithm, um, which is extremely good at making accurate predictions on held out data. It, it, I now know that that was an example of what people in applied statistics and machine learning consider um, a, a different sort of cultural choice, trying to rather than trying to work on a fundamental model where you understand everything, working with an effective model, and sometimes you don't even really care about the model, you care about whether or not the model makes accurate predictions on held out data, which is a very different mindset. Um, I now consider this an example of what people call data science. If you haven't heard of data science, it's been a term among computational applied statisticians since, since 2001 or so, uh, but really had a big um, explosion in interest around 2010 or so, which is when this cartoon um, dates from. And uh, after about five years, after I got tenure, I took a sabbatical from Columbia and went to the New York Times to try to help them create a data science team developing and deploying machine learning uh, for a variety of, of newsroom and business problems, which was very weird. It was just very different than my normal career uh, and therefore has been extremely educational because at the end of the sabbatical, I said, why don't we keep doing this? And so I've been helping them build out a data science team, mostly of former PhDs from the natural sciences, including biophysics, um, who are now um, just doing a great job, which not unlike running a research group, you hire really good people and then you get out of their way. So um, it's been very educational, I think for me and for the New York Times, you know, the New York Times is a very old company. And so it's an example of a company that's had a lot of cultural change as they try to understand machine learning in many ways, every day, it reminds me of working with biologists who have a way of knowing things, and then suddenly they have an abundant data set, and it's not really clear how to reconcile that data set with their way of knowing things. Um, so it's been fun. Um, during the pandemic, I wasn't able to go to conferences and do what I usually do, so I put my head down and started writing some books. So if you'd like to know more about uh, the way I'm thinking about data science, I wrote a book with a history professor, which is the one on the left, um, taking a historical look at how we, basically the history and ethics of data and how we make sense of data. And then I wrote a book with some computer scientists on the right, which is probably more applicable to people who are interested in careers in data, uh, trying to 
make sense of what we've seen both in industry and academia uh, in what is now called data science. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to send it to me in the chat, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll start and actually we're running low on time, so we might not have that much time for questions after. Um, but I'm curious about in this kind of boom in data science, you see all of these universities having different data science institutes, right? And they, they each seem to have their own unique definition of how exactly mm -hmm. they approach it. Um, how, how, do you kind of reconcile this? So you can give us a little preview of your, of, uh, of your book, some spoilers. Yeah, so the, the way data science is defined is, is different at different places, but it's also different in industry and academia. And in fact, in industry, you'll see different companies define it different, way, different ways. At the New York Times, we really consider it developing and deploying machine learning uh, and that sort of craft of trying to take problems from the real world and problems from collaborators and reframing it as machine learning and then putting that to work in a way that solves some complementary person's problems. And the Data Science Institute at Columbia, it's, it's, it takes a very big tent view on what is data science. And that's people trying to make sense of the world through data for a variety of fields, um, computational social sciences, data humanities, all the way through machine learning applied to the natural sciences and uh, a, a wide variety of subjects. Great. Um, I think we have a, a question coming in on on the chat, so I'm just gonna hold off. And the the reason the reason I asked is uh, throughout my career, I've been involved with various data science institutes um, at NYU. I, I I was up at DSI for a little bit as well, and uh, I, I I found it really fascinating about how different universities that are that are you know geographically very close to each other kind of approach this this field in, in completely different ways. Yeah. Agreed. Um, but it's still right, a new so, field, you know, it's just like nanoscience yeah, or systems biology. Or, absolutely. You know, if, if some of us were old enough for systems biology to be created and then, you know, yeah. somebody made a department of it or there was a time when nanoscience was big and it was not yeah. clear, like if I was working on microfluidics, was that nanoscience, you know? Um, so yes, it's still an evolving field. And this one I think is, is has extra dynamics because of the engagement of industry in particular. Absolutely, and I and I think you see that kind of geographically centered too, where where certain areas have have more industry influence and others might not. Yeah. Um, okay. okay, so a question that's come in is, what do you see as a um, uh, uniquely human efforts in science now that things like ChatGPT and GPT four exist? Human efforts. Yes. You, what what do you, what do you see as the the future of of us <laughs> interacting with the world? <laughs> I, I actually think that um, people continue to change their job descriptions when armed with new technologies. I mean, if somebody invents calculators or a spell check or, you know, technologies that help you finish the last sentence in your email, it's not like your job is going to end. It's, it's just that people um, continually are able to do different things and new things. And so uh, I'm sure ChatGPT is going to um, create new jobs it already has. Um, and you know, cause people to change the way they do their jobs. But I, I still think there's gonna be a role for human beings to add value. Absolutely, thank you.